Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry, uh, as per usual. But uh, today we are interviewing the wonderful Brandon Quittam, uh, entrepreneur, uh, writer, uh, a speaker and a builder of Swan Bitcoin. Um, I hope that was a, a good enough, very brief introduction of you there. But feel free to, to you know, uh, say hello and introduce yourself properly if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on, Lawrence, Jerry, Ricardo, the whole squad here. Um, yeah, that's generally who I am. I consider myself a uh, thinker, kind of like uh, on the fringe of society, trying to um, kind of explore new and weird things, try to synthesize them and, you know, produce cultural artifacts for the rest of the species. Um, in Bitcoin land, first bumped into it in like the Silk Road era, like 2011, 2012, 2013-ish. Uh, friends were buying drugs on the internet. Holy shit, what is this thing? How, how is that possible? Um, I never bought any then. I didn't think of it as an investment in any reason or any way. Uh, 2017 came around, numbers going up, pulled me in like, like many people, and then uh, came for the gains and then realized, wow, this is fascinating. Um, this is going to change the world. And I sort of uh, changed my whole life around that at that point. Um, prior, I spent time in enterprise software sales at Oracle, so working with big accounts on software. Um, then I went and did some entrepreneurial stuff for about five years, building online companies. And then but when I bumped into Bitcoin, I essentially realized that this is the new path and slowly sold off all those online businesses and then did a bunch of everything to, to finally break into the industry um, and ended up at Swan about a year and a half ago, a little more now, end of 2019. And then I've been building Swan ever since. And if you don't know what Swan is, it's just an easy way to buy Bitcoin. Uh, we're growing fast, focus on education, Bitcoin only. Um, our core product is an is a automatic recurring purchase plan, you know, buy 50 bucks a week or whatever your plan is. And then we automate everything for you. Uh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Back to you. No, I appreciate it. Thanks. You answered a few of my questions already, which is great. <laughs> so I already uh, diced a few of those out of the way. And yeah, I, mean, I guess like I'm, I'm keen to ask you some bits about Swan, but I guess before I do so, um, just want to kind of get like into your brain a little bit. Um, like, yeah. Uh, as to the whys and the hows kind of thing. So I guess when it comes to um, Bitcoin, like you've obviously said how you discovered it, et cetera. Um, I guess what, what interests me is like, um, you, you said you obviously had these businesses, you kind of just sold that off Bitcoin and then you made this, uh, this, this attempt essentially to, to move your life into the Bitcoin sphere. What, uh, what, was it, what was it about Bitcoin that kind of spoke to you, I suppose? What made you think, okay, this is like, this is what I need to do professionally as well as like, as you know, put my, uh, my funds into it and things like that. Yeah, definitely. I could answer this so many different ways, but I think the the actual reason, the primary reason, the, the, the stickiness that made me want to change everything has to do with the, the political implications of what the a Bitcoin system represents. So prior to Bitcoin, I would consider myself left leaning on the political spectrum, uh, cared a lot about changing the world. I'm a big picture thinker. That's how I like to think about the world primarily. And I saw these problems and those problems were not being solved. And I was trying to figure out how to fix those problems. I was literally making phone calls for politicians, doing everything I could, like wasting a lot of political energy trying to fix the system from the inside. And what Bitcoin, what, what, what it came to become for me was a parallel system, a way to address the root cause of these problems by building a new system rather than trying to fix the old system. And once those things clicked into place, I was like, great, I can maintain the path I'm on, but I can actually have a little hope or a little optimism about that. This work that I'm doing in the world might actually pay off. And so it's kind of like a dead end into seeing a, a tunnel of, of opportunity. Um, that's probably the best way to describe it. Um, from other reasons, like Bitcoin really clicked when I realized that it couldn't be stopped. I think that's probably the most important realization that most Bitcoiners go through. It's like, okay, sure, if you agree with the economics or you agree with the technology or something, fine. But if it is what we say it is, the state is going to squash it, right? I think that's a pretty rational uh, point to get to. And so kind of systematically thinking about it, how is it going to die or how could it die and, and how Bitcoin can survive all those attacks that really cemented it in my mind. Like, okay, if it can't die, then this thing's going forever. And yeah, of course, tied into a living organism, which I'm sure we'll get to 
that was another parallel thread here that, that gave you confidence. I first came across your work actually because of your uh, Bitcoin is the mycelium of money a series of articles. Um, I, I was looking on your blog and it seems like you've kind of condensed several articles into one. When I first read it, it was actually a series of articles. Um, what was the most striking parallel between Bitcoin and neural networks and mycelial networks that inspired you to, to write that series of blog posts? Yeah, definitely. And, and you're right, Ricardo. I wrote them all um, in series, part one, part two, part three, part four. And I posted them on Medium, and then I created my own website, brandingfooted.com. So I just merged them all together, smoothed out the transitions. And that's where I'd recommend reading them now. Uh, forget outsourcing your content to a third party. Um, what stood out to me the most? So I think, I think the most compelling thing here is that, uh, starting with Bitcoin, if you look at this thing, it's, it's kind of software, it's kind of hardware, it's kind of humans, um, it's, it's kind of a blend of all these things, right? It, it's a techno social system of some sorts, and it seems to adapt to its environment. It seems to learn. It seems to change over time. And so it, it's kind of hard to grasp, right? And depending on what way you look at it, it, you know, kind of look through a prism, your own experiences taint how you see Bitcoin or, or what parts stand out to you. And I have a, a long history of being just an amateur naturalist meaning I like camping and fishing and foraging and gardening and just everything related to biology I love. And so, and it, totally as an amateur, by the way, I'm not a scientist. And so when I started evaluating Bitcoin, um, I think it was originally the night, Lightning Network graph, just seeing the topological map of the Lightning Network. And I was like, oh, weird, that kind of looks like a mycelial network. And then the hamster wheel started to go. And so I think the most salient point here is that now tying into fungi, um, the primary archetype of a fungal organism is this mycelial network. Um, it is like a decentralized brain. And you can think of it like an underground root system. They also live in trees and, and other environments, but it's a series of tubes. Um, it's straight up industrial infrastructure underground that ships resources and information um, through all the forests, all the ecosystems and on our planet. It's pretty much everywhere. And it doesn't have a centralized decision-making point. There's no brain, there's no CPU. Instead, it's more like a combination of millions of individual fungal cells that share genetic information. And those fungal cells grow and branch off again in this little root structure. And they make decisions in their location. Right. Do I go this way or do I go that way? Do I eat this? Do I run away? Whatever. And it's the sum total of all these individual units combined that ultimately makes the organism. Right. And to give a, a to kind of anthropomorphize here for a second, let's say there's an invader that comes and attacks this mycelial mat, which could be the size of like um, an apple or it could be the size of a football field or the size of an entire forest. Right, so the scale, it could be any different size. And if a predator comes on one side, starts attacking this mycelial network, information travels through the system. It reaches the quote mushroom scientists uh, and fungi are the best chemists on the planet. Most of our medicine comes from fungi. Um, so it identifies a predator, sends information to the mushroom scientists. They create a custom molecule, a brand new enzyme to then go deal with that predator. Okay, then it ships that information over to the edge of the network, deals with the predator, and the system learns and adapts. And over time, it creates a chemical library of all these different molecules. And so again, it's adapting, it's learning. And I think the Bitcoin network is very similar, right? There's individuals, uh, both on like the node enforcing the rules or the hardware or, or just individuals like you and I. We all act in our own rational best interests based on how we see the world. And the sum total of all of us individually creates the network. And so I think that parallel is really nice. And if we want to anthropomorphize, anthropomorphize Bitcoin, what happens? Okay, we have a bug in the network or there's an attack from a nation state or some other sort of attack. Information travels through Twitter and Telegram groups. It reaches the right people, problems identified, developers write some new code, they release a, a software patch or enzyme, ships it through the network and deals with the attack, right? And so there's this decentralized brain and that archetype just, um, it mirrors really well. Um, Terrence McKenna, a famous psychonaut, he also called mycelium 
um, the wood wide web, right? And so that, that archetype has been going on for a long time. And I guess just putting those pieces together really started to make sense for me. That's a, that's a crazy, like, cool. I, 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 did, I didn't know, like, to that extent of how, like, mushrooms actually create new ways to basically defend against attacks. or I, I didn't know it was that to that level, actually. That's very interesting. I knew about, like, the web, but I didn't know, like, to the degree of, like, intelligence, I guess, that that has. Um, so that's pretty cool. I guess, like, I'm trying to think, because um, we can draw this, like, similarity, and you're kind of right, right, between Bitcoin and, and mycelium as, like, because, uh, as you said, there's obviously all these different tubes or nodes or whatever and then information travels via whatever form in person or internet whatever it is um and then i guess what what i suppose the learning from that could be i'm trying to think of like uh of how how that can be used to make the bitcoin network better i suppose would it be that if there's like an attack like a 51 percent attack everyone finds out and then we can essentially just trying to, I'm just, sorry, I know I'm going off a little bit randomly, but I guess I'm trying to, I'm trying to work out like, because you've, you've linked those two things together and I'm trying to work out what the learning from nature can be for the yes. Bitcoin network. You know what I mean? Like in a way to make it better or, or something. So I have a long list of those ideas, but the first one that comes to mind, pulling on your mycelial thread, excuse the lame pun. Um, the, big, the big teaching here is that fungal organisms or these decentralized network intelligence, that archetype, um, it's not just fungi. If you zoom in on neurons in our brain, our brain works the exact same way. It's a decentralized process that's constantly changing and evolving. And it's not like the hippocampus does one thing. It's like the hippocampus related to the this that's related to that, right? And so that's if you zoom in. If you zoom way out, you look at outer space, you look at the cosmos, it also forms the same decentralized network archetype. You look at a supercluster. Right? And you look at dark energy and dark matter, it forms the same network archetype. And so it seems to persist, which gives credence to an idea if it shows up in multiple scales over and over again, right? It's almost as if it's uh, an evolutionary strategy that seems to be effective. And if we bring it back to planet Earth, what we see is that fungal organisms are um, the longest standing complex life on our planet. Um, recent fossil records of over 1.3 billion years old were fungal fossils. Um, and we've had about five mass extinction events on our planet um, that we know of, right? Think of 65 million years ago, asteroid hits, kills the dinosaurs, things like that. And every time these cataclysmic events occur, what happens is all life on Earth goes through a massive transition, right? And in terms of the dinosaurs, we went from the age of reptiles to the age of mammals. Okay, and in that bottleneck of evolutionary history, what we see is that most life dies out. And what happens is fungi inherit the earth. They, they temporarily take over the entire planet and they essentially rebuild. And why is that? Well, they're the most survival, the creatures that are most adapted to survive. They find their own food. So they're not reliant on sunlight like plants are. Um, they also inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide, similar to animals, just like us, right? Opposite of plants. And they, they have this like ability to learn and reproduce in, in new novel ways and create new food sources, et cetera. And so I think the main lesson here is that these fungi are antifragile and they're built to survive. This, this decentralized archetype is hyper inefficient, but the inefficiency allows the adaptability and the survivability. And I think that's the, the main lesson of the mycelial network is that the centralization is adaptive and resilient, but it's also inefficient. And those are the trade-offs you need if, in order to uh, remove money from the power of the state and take it one step further, remove the power of individual humans or small groups or any type of power structure from changing the rules. And I think that's what gives me confidence long-term is that the system uh, removes human greed, or I should say it removes the influence of human greed, right? Our, each, each of our individual greed makes the network stronger, but we cannot change the system. And so, yeah, antifragil, that, that's what comes up for me as number one. I suppose like um, it, it goes to sort of show that I, I can't think of any centralized government or system that's actually managed to keep centralized power for longer than um, a century or something like that usually dynasties or uh, whatever die out eventually like something goes wrong with that centralized power whether it's the, the person who was the most powerful died and blah blah blah, blah. Um, and i guess with money as well as you kind of hinted on 
uh, it's like I, I guess the only thing I think of is like obviously if you're if you're relying on gold with like gold backed uh, currencies. Uh, which is like a net golds from nature, right? <laughs> the day, I suppose. Um, then that's usually when uh, you saw good periods of growth. And then as soon as governments took took things into their own hands in like the, the early 1900s, um, then that's when like, inevitably there's always going to be some kind of greed or some kind of oh well we can just just do this one thing here that's like and then boom that's where the centralized side of it causes problems is that someone the, the, the main power source or the person in control is always gonna there's always gonna be something tainted at the end of the day at some point because it's human nature um so i guess yeah as you say like if you have uh more decentralized well de decentralization is is nature i suppose then really um so i guess the more decentralized most things are generally the more fair or the more elongated and the more something is going to survive, basically. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think there's an interesting parallel here between um, industrial farming, mass scale, hyper efficient farming and nature, or let's say an old growth forest, right? So if we start with industrial farming or fiat food, um, the goal is to create as much food in as small a space for as cheap as humanly possible. So in order to do that, we essentially look at food like a manufacturing process, right? Inputs, outputs, decreased costs, et cetera. And that allows us to produce a shitload of food. Sorry, can we swear? I don't know, you let me know. All right, you can put a lot of food in a small amount of space, which is what we're doing with factory farming. But the problem is what we're doing is we're essentially strip mining the soil. We're taking all the nutrients out, right? It's, it's a very high time preference activity. It's, it's took us about 2 billion years to create topsoil and we're going to get rid of it all in 200 years. That's madness. And so what, what you get with fiat food or industrial farming or the fiat monetary system is hyper efficiency, but very low resiliency, right? And for example, we, there's this uh, famous example of the, the banana. Okay. Way back when, I think it was in the 50s, there was one species of banana grown all around the world. Like 99% of all bananas were, were all clones of the exact same, like literally clones, the same exact genetics all over the world. And you do that for efficiency. And then a fungus realized, whoa, there's a lot of food here. A fungus learned how to consume that banana, evolved, and now started attacking it. And then in the course of like two years, the entire banana crop of the planet died. Right. That's the risk. That's the anti-fragility um, of these systems. And so then what they do? Well, we came up with a new banana. We didn't learn. Now we have the Cavendish banana, our, our current primary banana you see in the grocery store. We didn't learn. Same deal. And guess what? It's being attacked by fungus. We're going to get a new banana. Um, to, to circle back to something more relevant, now let's talk about a old growth forest or Bitcoin. Right? These are emergent systems. These grow step by step. It's fierce competition. No plant is there because we planted it, right? The plant is there because it outcompeted its neighbor. And so it's, it's a biodiverse system. It's resilient to weather changes because there's lots of different organisms, each with their own strategy. Um, and that's a slower growing, less yield per acre. However, weather changes, predators, doesn't matter. It's gonna last forever. And that's kind of how Bitcoin's built. Right, it's way more efficient to use a, a visa-like system where you have a single node. Um, but with Bitcoin, right, we have multiple nodes. We have cheap validating hardware. We have a, a rough consensus. We have all these things that are inefficient, and yet that inefficiency is what provides the resiliency. And if we look at now just at the financial system in general, the fiat system, you mentioned things like um, man can only control. A uh, power structure or a monetary system for like 100 years, or even less usually, right? And why is that? Well, man can't help themselves. Whether we get greedy or we we see uh, the housing market crash, and the options are let the market fail or bail everyone out, right? If we allow humans to make a decision, we're always going to think short term. We're going to bail people out, right? If we're going to vote on it, that's what people are going to do. It's rational. And so that leads to a series of uh, systemic heightening of risk, right? We kick the can down the road. We don't let the market clear. And instead, we're suppressing all this volatility. Just stick it under the mattress, stick it under the mattress. And eventually, it becomes so big that, let's say, in 0809 financial crisis, uh, a small problem, mortgage-backed securities, one Jenga block is pulled and the whole system collapses. Um, and that would never happen if you allowed the market to clear initially. 
And so that's kind of like the, the fiat food, fiat money, uh, industrial farming, whatever, versus Bitcoin system, which, you know, it's going to let the market clear. It's going to smooth out the, the uh, volatility. It's going to smooth out the business cycle. And there will not be zombie corporations propped up by cheap money. The market's going to clear and the capital is going to recycle. And I think um, now one caveat here is the transition from a fiat monetary system to a more free market monetary system that's Bitcoin. No clue how that's going to go. Probably messy. But if we could just clear slate, wipe it clean, and I and I think that will happen eventually. I think a Bitcoin system um, will be better for humans, and it's going to be a much more long-term approach to building. Rather than start over every 30, 50, 100 years, we can build a new, steady, solid foundation that is Bitcoin, and that'll allow us as a civilization to grow much higher, do much more interesting things. Okay.